Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, March 16th, and we are starting with an amendment to H183, which is a bill regarding sexual assault. Uh, we did vote on the bill last week on Friday, and today it has been referred to the Appropriations Committee because there are two appropriations in it. Um, however, as we discussed on Friday, um, I did receive uh, an email from Wilda White expressing concerns about, about the bill, and we uh, wanted to make sure that we were able to um, hear from Wilda in quote-unquote person um, about her concerns. Um, in anticipation of today's uh, testimony, a few of us uh, met with Wilda, so let me make sure I get this right. Uh, Kate, Selena, me, Martin, Michelle, and State's Attorney Rory Tebow, I hope, and Martin, I hope I didn't forget anybody, um, met with Wilda yesterday um, to understand her concerns and try to reach a resolution. And uh, what you see in, in the amendment is, uh, is what I, I hope um, and I do think is acceptable. So but we will be getting direct testimony um, from witnesses today. So um, I will turn it over to Selena. I'm not seeing any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead. Um, sure, and I'm gonna do my best to describe the changes that were made and, and a little bit of the reasoning behind them, but I would encourage Maxine, Martin, Kate, Wilda, Rory, to feel free to jump in <laughs> since a lot of this came from some of you and from our discussion. Would people like me to share my screen so I can just project it and show you the, um, or are people able to follow along? Actually, that might be better because then we can toggle between the two without me having to like constantly change what I'm showing you. So if everybody is able to pull it up, the proposed amendment, you will find again under today. Um, so if you wanna look at the bill as passed, that's what's posted under Michelle Childs. Bill is recommended by House Committee on Judiciary. We're talking about H183. And if you wanna follow along with the amendment, um, that's posted under my name, Selena Colburn, H183, draft 1.2. So um, as you'll recall, I think we were trying to thread the needle here about um, in this bill being able to capture issues, um, capture issues where someone clearly was not consenting to sexual activity um, without uh, taking away agency or um, from folks in, in certain situations or uh, especially based on the um, presence of a, I guess, so-called disability as we were calling things in the previous statute. Um, so we, You'll see the first um, proposal of amendment is in section one in the definitions. We had previously um, said incapable of consenting means the person is incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct at issue. Um, we're changing here to the word appraising to understanding. Um, this is just some of these edits are just that this has been constructed in a slightly different way, but then we're adding. Excuse yeah. me, Selena. Um, Michelle just joined, so. Oh, great! <laughs> <laughs> you were doing great. Yeah, you were doing fine. <laughs> yeah, I figured it'd be a rehearsal for. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that was good practice. Right. But. Uh... No, that's great. Okay, I will turn things over to Michelle. So Michelle, I was just trying to walk through the amendment and getting us started. The definition. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank sure. you, Perfect. Michelle. Perfect. Um, so 
I don't. So the the draft that you have the amendment I did for Representative Colburn because the bill's out of your committee, so it has to be an individual instance of amendment offered by a by a House member on the floor. Um, and I also drafted it in a way so you could see the changes. I'll have to go back and clean up once you've kind of decided on the on the language here. So uh, the first change is in the definition of of of. Uh, incapable of consenting. And um, you'll see, I just had to change the structure in the subdivisions 10A and 10B. The word on line 14, the word appraising was changed to understanding. And then there was a, a new subdivision C added. Uh, so it's that the person lacks the mental ability to, to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. And then the other changes in the in the definition section are striking the cross references to developmental disability and psychiatric disability. So the second instance of amendment goes to section 3254. And that is the section where it goes through and enumerates what does not con uh, constitute consent. And so this is just uh, amending subdivision six so you see the amendment on uh, lines five through seven on subdivision 6A um, is just changing it so that the person uh, was mentally incapable of consenting. So we're tying it back up into that language in the definition section and taking out understanding the nature of because that's part of the definition of uh, incapable of consenting. And then the bigger change is on, uh, starting on line 14. And so uh, you'll see the language that struck there is the language that's currently in subdivision D. And then the bill is introduced and then the, and then the amendment that was voted out of committee just reconfigured that a little bit, but kept it in essence the same, but just updated the language. Um, and then the, the, the new language that's on line 17 through 20 was previously a, a subdivision E. Um, and so uh, after the meeting with some of the mental health advocates, uh, members in that working group decided to uh, eliminate the existing subdivision D. And so I just moved that E language from the previous draft up into subdivision D. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Tom. Thank you, Michelle. I mean, um, I mean, I'm only parroting what I've heard kind of, you know, that type of thing. Um, I certainly don't have an understanding of, you know, of being sexually abused. And, um, but what's going through my mind is C where we added C lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision. Um, you know, uh, I've read and heard, you know, different situations, whether it's whether it's kids or women or whoever that at some point they will freeze, you know, in a situation, um, you know, and, and really not communicate anything. And I'm just wondering if that would cover that. Well, you have already an existing law um, and also in the bill that you sent out, the amendment you sent out says that lack of uh, either verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. And so that's pretty straightforward right there. Okay, so that would cover what I'm, I'm talking about then? Well, I think in the case of if they're trying to say, well, there was a, a discrepancy about whether or not there was consent in uh, between the parties that um, the fact that somebody didn't verbally object or physically object doesn't indicate that that means consent. Okay. So, so, so they, so that's a part of, I think that kind of gets to what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of fresh in my mind. I just started watching a, a movie with Michael Keaton about the, the, the sexual abuse in Boston in the seventies. So, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they hit on that a little bit, but thank you. I'm thinking that probably falls under a lot of these provisions. Sure. That kind of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different things that can that fit under different ones. And certainly when it comes to under 16, under 16 can consent, period. So. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yep. 
Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else? I'm not seeing any hands, but just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Mm -hmm. So, Wilda White, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Wilda White and I am the founder of Mad Freedom. Uh, Mad Freedom is frequently um, misidentified as a mental health um, advocacy organization. And I wanna be clear that uh, Mad Freedom does not advocate on behalf of mental health. Uh, Mad Freedom advocates on behalf of people who are perceived as having a mental illness, pardon me. Um, my cam I'm gonna be probably turning my camera on and off because I see it's beginning to freeze. Um, but Mad Freedom advocates on behalf of people who are perceived as having mental illnesses and are, dis are discriminated against on the basis of that. And the reason I think it is important to, to bring that to the uh, committee's attention is because that is how we enter into this bill. Um, Mad Freedom was troubled by the language in the bill that um, took away the agency and dignity of people who had a mental condition or a psychiatric disability or even a developmental disability simply on the basis of that disability. And the definitions that you included uh, in the bill for psychiatric disability um, really captured, it was, you really borrowed those definitions from other areas of law and the reason those definitions existed in those areas of the law are very different from whether someone has the capability of consenting to um, a sexual act. Um, and so there were two things specifically that uh, we felt kind of perpetuated this prevailing social attitudes towards people with um, perceived as mentally ill that were based upon kind of stereotype and myth and superstition and de-individualization. Um, that we wanted this uh, committee to address. The first is just simply putting in the bill um, those words, psychiatric disability and developmental disability um, and deeming those, deeming that as a, a, a reason that someone couldn't consent to sex. The second one was your definition of incapable of consenting because when I did legal research on how other courts have interpreted incapable of consenting, they interpret that as meaning a person has to know both the nature of the sexual act, that it is sex. Secondly, that they have the right to refuse um, and that they know the risk and consequences, for example, that you can get pregnant or you can uh, contract a uh, socially transmitted disease. And also, that you be able to weigh the morality of the conduct, whether it's good or bad, or whether there are social taboos about it and how you might be viewed by society based on those taboos. Um, and that's the definition that this, um, this committee adopted when it, it passed the version of H-183 that you just passed. Um, but in doing research, you know, this definition of incapable of consenting is not uniform across the 50 states in, the Washington, in Washington, D.C. What I had advocated for in the letter I wrote last week is for a disability neutral statute. That is a statute that does not mention disability in either the substantive offenses or any separate statutory definitions. And where incapacity to consent is really defined based on an inability um, to understand the nature and or consequences of one's conduct, regardless of the underlying cause and uh, regardless of the temporal nature of that incapacity. And in doing research, I realized there, there are five states and the District of Columbia whose sexual assault laws are disability neutral and actually um, do what I, 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 I wanted this committee to do. Um, and the final thing I'll say about this is that um, you might think that, and I think um, the state's attorney made the argument that, that, that he's not interested in prosecuting people who, um, uh, you know, for consensual sex. And the danger is, and in the, in the, in a court in New Jersey said that the danger of the definition that this committee uh, adopted 
um, was that it criminalizes consensual sex um, because it, it's the, the it's too restrictive in terms of who can consent and what you need to know um, to consent. Um, and even though I understand prosecutors aren't interested in necessarily, you know, criminalizing consensual sex and wouldn't bring those kinds of cases, what I did see happening in the case law that I reviewed was that that definition that's in the criminal statute is being borrowed in civil litigation. So in some cases where a parent um, was upset that their child who has a disability had engaged in a sexual relationship, they were suing the defendant um, for um, some kind of a tort, some kind of neg some kind of kind of civil um, uh, some civil law, and they were borrowing that definition that they found in the criminal law to try to hold um, the defendant um, guilty um, based on their daughter's. Usually, <laughs> all the cases I found daughter's disability, and so what you do in the criminal law does not just stay in the criminal law. Um, it can, it, it can affect what happens in civil law and definitely in civil society. So um, taking away the dignity and agency of people um, in this criminal law affects all areas of our lives. And that's kind of what I wanted um, this committee to address. Um, and, and so what we hit upon in this, um, the, the amendment that you see before you is something that we think is a, a much stronger law. Um, it, I think it, it, it it accomplishes uh, the intent of uh, a sexual assault law and at the same time um, respects the dignity and agency of people um, regardless of their disability and uh, protects people who, who might need protection in, in certain situations. Um, and so we, we support that law, we support that amendment and we think it addresses our, our concerns. I did have a conversation with um, Zach Hosed um, this morning about the amendment, and and he pointed out two things that um, I thought were 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 would, would be good um, <laughs> amendments to the amendments, if you will. And and the first was in your definition of, um, I guess it's it's on page two of the amendment, and it's line six. Um, well, that that subdivision begins, knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was mentally incapable of consenting to the sexual act. Uh, he suggested or wondered, why did we have the word mentally there? And I think that's a good question. I, I, I think in fact, it, it's confusing because you've defined incapable of consenting in a way that takes account of the mentally. So I don't think we need it. And I think that it's a better statute if it's removed. So I would, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Hosett there. The other question he raised was on something that also I think Representative Burdick raised, and that was um, not you, you pointed to the same section, but you have a, you had a different question about it. But it's um, on page one of the amendment uh, number, the definition of incapable of consenting, that paragraph C, where you say lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. Uh, Mr. Hosey thought that was confusing using the putting the word mental there and he actually suggested that it didn't need to be there at all. I thought um, in response to him that I think C is, is, is good to include if you eliminate the word mental. It, so basically it lacks the ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. Because I think then C operates almost as a catch-all uh, way of um, understanding how someone might be incapable of consenting that we just right now may not be able to foresee. So you've covered somebody who doesn't have the understanding of the sexual of the of the of the conduct at issue in A. And B, you've covered someone who's physically incapable of declining. Um, and C, if you remove mental, it's somebody who just doesn't have the ability for whatever reason that we may not be able to foresee right now they don't have the ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conducted issue. So I think that makes it, uh, I think it eliminates, Mr. Hosett said it definitely satisfied him that he felt like it was less confusing and more clear. Um, and I think it covers the universe of people who may need this protection who are incapable of consenting. Um, so I will conclude there.
I appreciate your um, your inviting me to testify and your um, open mindedness to this amendment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walden. I really, really appreciate um, you working with us and, and bringing, bringing your viewpoint and, and expertise. And um, I wish we had gotten there, gotten there sooner. Uh, any questions, committee members or Michelle? Uh, Tom. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just a question for Wilda on that on that C and removing mental, which uh, I think is a good idea because I, I think with it gone, it uh, um, it kind of goes without saying <laughs> in, in some way. So is the concern there by having mental in there? It, it kind of uh, and you may have said it. It defines it almost and and, uh, and doesn't make it as broad as it as it could or should be. That's exactly my point. Yes, I think okay. it needs to be broader because there are way there people can have the inability to, to to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in sex that's broader than just the mental ability. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Ken, I no question was just uh, Tom just answered it. Will they just answered? Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to note that Representative Ann Donahue uh, was invited to testify and was all set to testify before we um, drafted this amendment. And then she did review the amendment and um, felt that she was quote unquote all good and uh, <laughs> is, is not is not coming to testify. So I just want to make sure folks knew that. Um, Rory Tebow, State's Attorney, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you for inviting me back. Um, so for the record, Rory Tebow, Washington County State's Attorney. Uh, I'll first start by saying uh, it was nice to make acquaintance with Wilda yesterday. It's the first time we had to, got an opportunity to meet uh, virtually and uh, we had a good discussion. So from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs I can represent, um, you know, our goal is to have a workable sex assault statute that gives credit, I think, to everybody, including those who we're seeking to protect under the law. Uh, so the input from uh, Matt Freedom and also from previously from Zachary Hosett of Disability Rights Vermont, I think was well taken. And in the changes proposed on um, the most recent draft include transitioning of the word appraise to the word understand. That was a recommendation made uh, by Zachary previously. And then Wilda gave some, I think, important context to that. And uh, if I can, I want to re I want to go back over a little bit of the discussion we had yesterday for some further context of, of how we arrived at some of that language. So it is critically important, and I don't believe that the prior draft did, in fact, in any way overextend or attempt to criminalize a status or class-based basis of prosecution on the mere diagnosis of either a psychiatric disability or a developmental disability as uh, provided for under statute. Uh, that said, um, we are sensitive and recognize that uh, that could be perceived as taking away agency. But in a practical term, I think it's important to understand that when we prosecute a case, it's either on the basis of a complaint from a victim, uh, him or herself, or alternatively uh, from a caretaker, which is more commonly seen in circumstances where someone is developmentally disabled. Some of the cases we reviewed or discussed in terms of examples included an individual with dementia who was sexually assaulted, along with someone with a traumatic uh, brain injury uh, who was receiving services from Dale. So that's the context there. Um, but that said, I think it is important to note that uh, we don't want to be overly paternalistic and at the same time um, need to ensure that uh, the final law reads in a manner that um, is acceptable and appropriate to uh, all stakeholders involved. In terms of the specific discussion today, I, I would recommend against further um, changes to the language, particularly looking at the newly revised subpart C of section one, which states lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. So first, just to cover at the base level, the concept of consent, it's centered around the mental state of the alleged victim. So we really can't separate out that state. Other jurisdictions that have uh, gone in greater depth, I think have other definitions that we are not using and are not currently provided for. 
Um, in the absence of that reference to mental, other states have used things such as cognitive ability or tried to define whether someone is competent or incompetent to engage in a sexual relationship. These are definitions that are not present in Vermont statute, but are in some of the other states uh, that have been referenced. And I appreciate Wilda's research, particularly into looking at um, those other jurisdictions, which was helpful to understand how the term understand and appraise is looked at differently in jurisdictions. Uh, for the record, the model that we would be adopting or uh, supporting is the one utilized in New Jersey, also in federal law under interpretation of 18 USC 2422, uh, which uh, criminalizes sexual abuse at the federal level and also uh, the Title 10 definition. So with that said, I think we always are looking at the mental state of a victim and including the express reference to mental, I think is helpful when you are dealing with, uh, if you recall from last time or one of the prior times I testified was the fight flight or freeze sort of analysis of how people respond, particularly the freeze. Mental state when someone is in a dissociative state from PTSD or some other condition is something that we see and deal with in prosecutions where someone just shuts down. So while they're not suffering a psychiatric disability or potentially dealing with a TBI, their then existing mental state precludes the ability to respond. In this circumstance, they're not physically incapable of doing so, and they may actually appreciate or understand what is happening to them, but are not able to, to verbalize. Sometimes that's out of fear, sometimes it's out of a shock response. So I think direct reference to the mental state is important because ultimately what the fact finder is looking at is the mental state of, of defendant. In certain circumstances, someone who's unconscious can't form a mental state because they're not awake or able to do so, but there are a wide range of circumstances where uh, that is relevant. So in that sense, in the proposal for subpart 10 of 3251, see, I uh, recommend, recommend against the committee making further modification. Uh, insofar as the uh, definition set forth under, in this bill, uh, in the revision, the subpart 6A, in section three, so this is page two or three of the amendment. Um, in terms of removing the term mentally incapable and just having it begin with was incapable, that's not as uh, a big of a change, but I think it is an emphasis point that the mental state of the victim uh, is important and would tend to mirror and differentiate subpart A from subpart B, which uh, is premised upon an individual who's physically incapable of resisting. And again, the, the general consent definition is used not only in the context of uh, sex assault under uh, this part of Title 13, but also has applicability to the vulnerable ad adult statute and also to lewd and lascivious conduct. And I also believe that consent is uh, a relevant consideration when we're looking at human trafficking offenses. So this uh, definition of consent has utility outside of just the, the, the direct context of sex assault for this section. So uh, with that said, um, I think that the modifications made on uh, and the amendment are appropriate uh, and strike the balance between uh, crediting the agencies of individuals who have uh, or really making this a uh, neutral uh, in terms of its language of anyone uh, who would in fact have a psychiatric or developmental disability as defined by statute and yet ensures that we're properly crediting and providing guidance to uh, the fact finder about mental state and its uh, critical nature when it comes to uh, these cases. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, um, this may, may be a question for Wilda, I'm not sure, maybe Rory. Uh, it seems to me that 6A on page two, that getting rid of mentally there makes a lot of sense because it's referring back to the definition and it allows us to also consider the physically inability, the incapable of understanding, the mental ability. So I, I think that that part definitely is clear to me. Uh, but with respect to the definition, I guess it seems to me that I'm not bothered by it saying mental ability there because we have physical incapability essentially on one and we have mental ability on the other. And I'm not sure how we wouldn't be covering 
uh, the field really essentially. And I guess that is more of a question for, for Will Dwight uh, than for Rory. You know, when I hear um, Mr. Tebow's explanation about uh, how, how mental state is so fundamental to the laws of consent, I don't disagree with that. I don't think though that the word ability conveys, I think there's a dictionary difference. <laughs> there's, a def there's a definition uh, difference between ability and state. Um, state is more uh, temporal. It's like uh, that, that can vary, but one's mental ability is more fixed, I think. Um, uh, so I don't know if by leaving the, the phrase mental ability in there, actually um, you're accomplishing the what the state's attorney wants to accomplish. Um, and I was also in. I was also responding to Mr. Hosett, who was reading this fresh. He wasn't in the room yesterday when we were uh, constructing this, and it was confusing to him. And I think that um, that's something to pay attention to. I have to say, I've also lost a little bit of track of your question, Representative Malone. So if I haven't answered it, let me know. <laughs> well, I I think so. I just I'm just. It seems to me that if if we're covering physical in one subparagraph, mental in the other paragraph, that we have all the bases covered. Uh, that 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 was my question. I, I do think that's one way of, of reading that. That's. But I'm also concerned that those cases that we can't foresee, you know, where a person hasn't been, and you can get into some really bizarre scenarios that you see on TV that I'm not really that interested in recounting for this committee right now, but you would need a C that didn't have the word mental um, to, I think, to really fully protect that person. Um, but, you know, Mr. Tebold is the prosecutor um, he, and, if, if I, in the spirit of compromise, if that's what he feels he needs, then I'm not going to say don't support the bill on the basis of that. But I can see the other side that it is confusing and that there are benefits to removing it. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Anybody else? Uh, Ken. So I'm trying to understand this and I'm having a hard time doing this. Is, is the problem with this is, is the mental, the, the word mental being used too much in narrowing this, uh, too much for you, Wilda? Is that what you're thinking? Okay, are we talking just now about um, 10C? Are we also talking about uh, 6A? Well, we could start with, we could start with C. Okay, so in 10C, I think it's too narrow and doesn't cover all the situations where somebody might not have the ability to make or communicate a decision. Um, if you remove mental from that, you expand um, you cover more people, I think. So I don't think the word mental there is like discriminatory or offensive or perpetuates stereotypes. It's not that at all. It's just that I don't think it covers the universe. Now, if we moved over to 6A, um, I think the word mentally in front of incapable of consenting, I think it actually, um, you don't need the word mentally there because you, because you've put you defined incapable of consenting, and if you were trying to give meaning to every word as judges do in statutory interpretation, I think the word there is would be confusing, and the court would make up a reason why that word is there, that might <laughs> undermine the definition of incapable of consenting. So, I just think it's unnecessary in six. A, it may confuse a judge because you've def already defined incapable of consenting that incorporates in the definition, the mental element of it because you said understanding. So when a judge is looking at this and saying, okay, the legis legislature says incapable of consenting includes incapable of understanding. I wonder what they meant by being mentally incapable of understanding. That's just confusing. Do you understand, am I, am I confusing you? <laughs> uh, 
a bit, but now now I'll ask uh, state's attorney to, to help me out how he's uh, looking at prosecuting this. Maybe maybe that'll fix my state of mind. Please. Um, well, so I think that I think what uh, Representative Lund indicated is probably the right path, which is retaining the word mentally in uh, 10C as it is, and then removing the word mentally from 6D. I think that would appropriately capture this. And, and just from that standpoint, there, it's our obligation to show uh, at trial that there was not, there's a lack of consent. Otherwise, we're not dealing with a sex assault when we can't sustain our burden of proof at trial. And incapable of consenting gives us, under this definition, really three paths to get there. Uh, one, the person could not um, demonstrate or make, communicate an unwillingness that they are physically incapable. That's easy, you know, someone who's asleep, unconscious, or, you know, restrained. And again, noting that this definition applies across the spectrum uh, of activities. And then finally, lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision about whether to engage in the conduct at issue. And so that's sort of the then existing mental state. And the easiest example to think of is, let's say you have somebody who is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and, and maybe had been subject to prior sexual trauma. And when faced with that situation, um, entered into a dissociative state or shut down. Uh, so that person may again, realize what's going on. They may physically, you know, their vocal cords aren't immobilized. They're not tied up. There isn't this physical inability to communicate. Rather, it is a mental condition that has precluded their um, ability to decline consent. So I think that, to be honest, Representative Landa, I think summarized it better than I, I, I could have under the circumstances of indicating that we have effectively in that section gone through the three different uh, possibilities and having a clear clear reference to mentally and, and physically is clear. And, and in lay terms, I think it's something that uh, jurors would understand it being instructed upon. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, any, any other questions for Rory? Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Rory. Thank you so much. Sure. And um, actually, um, I think I'll move to, to, uh, to Zachary now. Uh, since great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, so Zachary Jose, Disability Rights Vermont. Um, I looked at the, uh, the proposed amendment that we're going over this morning, um, and as uh, Wilda pointed out, I had some questions about it. And we talked about it, and I really don't have much to add at this point. I think where the amendment is good, I had those two those two suggestions that, um, and it sounds like, um, you know, and I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with what others have said about, um, you know, particularly on on six A about it being confusing to have mentally. Um, there and then going on to the definition of incapable of consenting, um, and as well to point out in in uh, the definition in 10 C, um, I just I think it is a little bit limiting. But um, I I do also see the argument that uh, you know mental state is a factor, and that sort of clarifies that. And yeah, you, you do also have the other two other definitions, so that that could capture everything. Um, so that's really all I have, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Okay, great. So how about uh, Attorney General's office, please? Do you have a chair? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, our office has had a brief chance to review the proposals. Uh, we have no objection to them. They are in line with some of the issues and considerations we discussed briefly in prior testimony and in prior discussions. With respect to the issue that was just brought up today around the placement of mentally, I do agree with the direction it seems to be moving in uh, with retaining it in the first part and uh, excising it in the second part. If I got that backwards, I apologize, but what Representative Aland was moving towards, I think makes sense. Uh, and hopefully I restated it in the same way. Um, 
And with that, that's that's our testimony. Happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Not not seeing any at this point. Okay. We move to the Defender General's office, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office for the record. Seems the way that this is heading that I may be the lone oppo uh, opposing voice to the current draft of uh, H183. And I want to just share what I understand has between what is passed and what is being currently proposed. What this bill does is criminalizes a sex for sexual assault to adults where at least one adult has disabilities and where they both engage in what they both think to be consensual sex. And I'll take you how I understand that. And even though the language here, as I understand it, uh, under page one, three, I guess it's 10, the uh, language that's being discussed in terms of how to characterize the groups of people who are deemed per se incapable of consenting. The discussion today is about talking about expanding those groups even more. So I just want this committee to understand what is going on here and what the trend is, which is that you're increasing, you're proposing increasing per se categorically groups of people who will not be deemed able to consent even when they do. And that to me is going against what the concerns in terms of agency, uh, of individuals, adults, otherwise seeking and wanting to engage in consensual sex, removing that from them on the basis of undefined vague terms, physically incapable of declining participation. I'm looking at line 15, 10B, physically incapable. Does that include people who are in wheelchairs, people who can't walk, uh, people who somehow can't walk faster than someone? It doesn't, I don't understand who these are, who these people are. Uh, and even though they want to engage in sex with, se in, have sex with a person, they are deemed physically incapable because of some uh, disability. I don't see that merely removing the word disability from the statute addresses the concerns that I understood uh, Wilda White as raising previously. Uh, I, I think that the concerns are just uh, remain and uh, even expanded upon. So between the discriminant, discriminating against people who are physically incapable of declining participation, discriminating against people who are mentally uh, unable to communicate. I think that now you have, you are proposing a law that violates um, equal protection clause, common benefits clause. And I, I don't know if there's been considerations of whether or not the ADA uh, has, is, is, this is consistent with the ADA. I would urge this committee to invite more witnesses who represent uh, the perspectives of adults with disabilities uh, to testify. I think that there is a group that th this committee could benefit from listening to, Disabled Parenting Project, Robin Powell, uh, where she represents uh, the rights of parents or prospective parents with disabilities, uh, pushing their rights forward in terms of um, their ability to not be discriminated against uh, by, by state laws and treating them as equal. This bill does not treat people with physical disabilities and mental disabilities equally. And, and, I, and I don't see how, the, um, how that is served. So there, there, is, there is that problem. Now I've talked separately on the issue of, of the lack of mens rea. Um, but here, what, 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 what this, the law still has to do is draw clear lines as to what counts as legal consent between the expansive and 
constantly expand, expanding definition of, of what it means or what it doesn't mean to be able to consent, uh, this line is just increasingly being blurred. So, so this goes to the issue of notice requirements. Now we've heard the state's attorney um, testify today about what he will or will not prosecute, how he will or will not interpret the statute to be, but constitutional notice requirements don't turn on what one elected prosecutor of one county testifies before a committee and what, how they'll interpret it. Uh, of course, it would, it's what uh, we can understand this language in the bill to, to mean. And as I've testified before, and I think that here where the proposals now are just to, to expand the terms even more, the uh, problems with vagueness, the problems of overbreath are just exacerbated. I don't have any further comment, uh, but if there are any questions, I'll pause now. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not sure that this is a question, but I, I just find the reading that you just gave us uh, really doesn't comport with the language that we have here. We're not talking about physical disabilities. I, I don't see how this particular provision applies to the sample example that you gave as far as somebody in a wheelchair. Somebody in a wheelchair could be completely physical, physically capable uh, and mentally capable of, of uh, agreeing to participate mm -hmm. or declining to participate. That, that that's not, doesn't seem to be what this is getting at. It's whether the individual is able, be it physically or mentally, able to decline. Uh, and, and I don't see, how, I mean, it's, and it's not necessarily wrapped up in whether there's a, a developmental, a psychiatric, or a physical disability, uh, it's just that uh, you know. It's so. I guess I'm just not not seeing your point on that. And and, I, and maybe there's not a question there. I'm just um, not well, I could, I, I, the same concern. I could respond. I mean, just looking yeah, at the physically incapable of declining participation. Admittedly, doesn't use the words physical disabilities, but physical. In, in, physically incapable of declining participation. So this person could want to have sex with a person, but cannot physically decline. What does that mean? Does that mean that they can't remove themselves physically from the situation? How is that not separate or distinct from a physical disability? It's it, this, I think that the language in 10B is broader than physical disabilities, but I don't think it, it excludes it. And that's the problem. I think that the same issue arises with 10C. Uh, it's broader, lacks the mental ability to make or communicate a decision, doesn't, isn't limited to people with mental disabilities that prevent them from making or communicating a decision, it's broader, right? So this language is broader, but includes people with mental and physical disabilities. And therefore under 10, by definition, these broad groups, groups that incorporate people with disabilities are per se incapable of consenting. So, so if, I, if I can, just to make sure I understand where you're coming from on that, that essentially somebody who is unable to say yes and is unable to say no, the default is no consent. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Whether, whether it's physical or mental ability. That's right. I, I read 10 as incapable of consenting means that they cannot, that they want, they even if they want it, their physical disability overrides their agency, their will of wanting to have sex. All right, thank you. No, that, that clarifies, uh, clarifies that. I guess, I, I mean, I would like if, if uh, any prosecutor has kind of a response as far as that, but I think that, uh, or I see that will the white, one of the other witnesses, it'd be interesting to hear from them. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, let's start with uh, Wilden and, and then go to Rory, if he'd like. Go ahead, Wilden. Yes. When I hear Rebecca, uh, Attorney Turner's testimony, I feel like she's reading 10 
without the context of the sexual assault law. Because this is only in the context where someone is, has been accused of sexually assaulting someone and the alleged victim has said, I didn't consent. And the reason I didn't consent was because of this. So this is, this is you're, you're only reading, when I, the only way I can understand what you're saying is if you're only reading it um, without that context. Um, and so I don't understand why you think, I don't agree and I don't understand how you can read the whole bill um, and think that this is saying that someone with a physical, physical disability cannot consent to, te to, to sex. That's not how any state in the whole United States has read um, this bill or this language, because this is not new language. This is, this is language that's shared by many states. Um, and the other thing is when you say that you want this committee to stop and hear from people who have disabilities, well, that's who they're hearing from, from me. I have been labeled with a severe disability. I have spent years of my life in a psychotic manic state. And I can tell you that I have the right to have sex and I, have, and I know that when I am psychotic or manic, I still am capable of consenting to sex. I also, in the course of advocating this position, reached out to Green Mountain Self Advocates and Sarah Londeville at the Center for Independent Living. Um, and they don't, um, you know, so they had an opportunity to, to come here. So it's not like um, this committee has not heard from people who would be affected uh, by it. And I'm also a sexual, sexual assault survivor. So I bring that perspective to it. And I don't read this bill in any way um, like you're saying, um, you read it. And I also don't think the parents of people who might have a disability is the right person to advocate on behalf of people who have disabilities. That is also taking away the dignity and agency of adults um, to advocate on behalf of themselves. And so th that would be my response. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Rory, if you, if you, if you'd like. Sure, I don't have much more to add, but I, I would disagree with uh, Ms. Turner's assessment of that. And the important thing to note is the standard here is at the moment in time that a sexual act is occurring. So Will is absolutely correct that this really is part of an alleged sex assault. And again, we don't, cases, the Vermont State Police or local municipal departments are not running around in, in you know, looking into people's bedrooms or private activities, they respond to complaints that are made when there is belief that there has been a sexual assault committed. And the definition here is neutral and is limited to that period of time. None of this is class or status based. There's not some sort of categorical prohibition that says because of a diagnosis or because of a physical limitation, there is an inherent inability to consent. Quite the contrary, the analysis in court, the corresponding jury instructions I anticipate would be adopted and the existing jury instructions we have that deal with this are all centered around the attendant facts and circumstances of the incident. And again, part of this language ties back into whether you know someone's degree of intoxication and whether that re has rendered them physically unable to participate or, uh, or satisfying the other definitions. So it is circumstantially based in that moment. And um, to put it in this way, you can have someone who is fully able-bodied who does not have any diagnosis or physical limitations that can meet this definition at some point in time because of impairment, because of injury, because of infirmity. And likewise, you can have somebody with a developmental or physical or um, psychiatric disability as was previously defined in the statute who can consent fully, freely, and intelligently under the circumstances, irrespective of the fact that they have a label or a, a diagnosis attached to them. That's the reality of the state of the law. And again, I agree with Will that, that there are many other jurisdictions that have adopted this uh, successfully. And this is not a definition or a structure that runs afoul of due process at either under federal law or the Vermont constitution. I think quite the contrary, this has been a um, been carefully worded to ensure that we're only dealing with what is occurring at that moment and in the particular circumstance. Madam Chair, may I respond and clarify? 
Um, sure, thank you. So first, when I referenced uh, the perspectives of others uh, having disabilities, I did mean, and, and I wanna make sure I recognize that those, that some, that there have been witnesses here to share perspectives from that community. I suggested uh, a particular community that I'm aware of that's uh, not parents of disabled children. So I wanna clarify, it's parents or prospective parents with disabilities. And that group is called Disabil Disabled Parenting Project, uh, Robin Powell. Uh, and I think just hearing as many different voices uh, who uh, speak from, the, uh, from that perspective would be beneficial. So one. Two, there was some suggestion that I am, I am reading the definition section out of context and not within the whole. And actually, I am reading uh, the entirety of H183 and particularly the, the parts that have already passed. Uh, page three, uh, there is a section on 3254 trial procedure and consent. Um, confusingly, of course, the sexual ass uh, assault bill defines and establishes what is and what isn't consent, who and who cannot consent in many different parts. It's not just under page one of the definition section. So what I have done is try to understand reading this in its entirety, what it means, how we can understand what it means to have lawful consent. And particularly when you look at the, uh, this, the language in 3254, new language not previously adopted, uh, where prosecution of sexual assault now, um, that lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. And it goes on to list other things about what does not constitute consent. So if there's lack of verbal or physical resistance, that does not constitute consent. I've testified previously with questions as to what would constitute lawful consent after this bill is passed. And I still don't understand what would constitute lawful consent. And I think that is again where this new language adds to the problem of what providing sufficient notice uh, of where that line is drawn. Because here I think you can have two consenting adults who are otherwise uh, one of them falls within this broad, really broad and undefined, undefined language in 10 A, B, and C, um, but otherwise consenting. And now we are in the, um, the category of sexual assault. And so here I have the final question, which is what is the community, committee's uh, justification for punishing with life imprisonment for which there is no culpability on the issue of consent? where there is in fact two consenting adults and no notice of what is and what is not lawful sex. I don't think that criminal, that American criminal law supports uh, criminalizing with, with life imprisonment uh, where there is no culpability required on consent or there cannot be a notice of what is lawful consent. Um, and so I, again, just restate my strong opposition to this uh, bill and this latest draft. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So committee, let's take a, um, let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back. Thank you.